Are you tired of searching for great talk radio? Search no more. We are the GCN Radio Network. Welcome to this week's edition of World Crisis Radio. This is Webster Topley reporting this week from Reykjavik, Iceland. We are in the capital of Iceland. This is a small country in the middle of the North Atlantic. We've got Greenland to our west and to our east. We've basically got uh, Norway and uh, northern Scotland. So we're sitting out here. Uh, we're on Greenwich Mean Time. Uh, and... Uh, Right now it's uh, it's uh, noon in Minneapolis, but it's uh, five o'clock in the afternoon here in Reykjavik, and we're recording on October second, two thousand and nine. This is the day when Ireland is going to the polls to decide for the second time whether or not they want the Lisbon Treaty. Last year, Ireland had already said once that they reject the Lisbon Treaty, which is an oligarchical, elitist monstrosity imposed by the Eurogarchs and Eurocrats in Brussels. And maybe, possibly, before the end of the program, we might have some updates from Ireland, how the, uh, the election is going, whether there's a big turnout or not. People here in Iceland are hoping that the Irish will say no to this Lisbon Treaty, this oligarchical monstrosity. But right now here in Iceland, we are in the epicenter of what amounts to an economic war. This gallant little country is standing up to the bullying of the British lion, the thug uh, Gordon Brown, the British Prime Minister Gordon Brown, with his gangster methods and his ally, Prime Minister Balkanenda of the Netherlands. These uh, economic exploiters are attempting to use a policy of blackmail, threats, and extortion against Iceland. They are trying to extort 4 billion euros, which translates into 6 billion U.S. dollars from a small country with just over 300,000 population and a gross domestic product, which is between 11 billion and $12 billion estimated, even though that contains a lot of financial hot air. So here is where we are now. The uh, British and the Dutch have recruited the European Commission in Brussels under the dubious Iberian right-winger Barroso of Portugal, the tin-pot dictator of the European Commission, to help them in extorting money from Iceland. They've also got the International Monetary Fund coming in with their usual methods, letter of intent, conditionalities, secret protocols, threats, uh, all kinds of trickery, attempting to get Iceland to attempt to pay the debt. Well, the one thing we know is that this debt cannot be paid. It is simply a physical impossibility. In the physical universe, constituted as we know it to be, there is no way that Iceland, with its 12 billion, and actually far less, in gross domestic product, could ever pay a $6 billion debt to the British and the Dutch. You could destroy the country in the process, but you, uh, you'd never pay the debt. This reminds us that this is simply the world predicament. Iceland's condition is the human condition. It's typical of the United States. Let's remember, in the United States, we've got about 1,000 trillion, one quadrillion of poisonous, toxic, deadly derivatives. And we've got about, what, 15, billion, uh, 15 trillion to 16 trillion as a gross domestic product. It means that it's about 24 to 25 to 1. Uh, between the derivatives and the real productive base. And, of course, the productive base is even smaller than the GDP would suggest. So really what's happening to Iceland is a laboratory and a pilot project for the human condition as a whole. Will Iceland be destroyed by the zombie bankers? 
Will the zombie bankers be able to work their will on this country? Will they ruin everything, destroy the labor force, and uh, essentially turn this place back into tundra? Will they put an end to human civilization in this part of the world where civilization has existed for a thousand years since the coming of the Vikings? Remember, it's from Iceland that Leif Erikson and Eric the Red came across to North America, right? The first Europeans uh, to get to North America were Icelanders, in effect, right? There's a tradition of culture here that goes back for the best part of a thousand years. Christianity has been here since about the year 1000. We have the sagas. We have the poetic Edda, the prose Edda, the works of Snorri Sturluson, all kinds of classics of literature going back into the, uh, the Middle Ages. Is that all going to be destroyed just because the gangster Gordon Brown woke up one morning and decided in the middle of an economic blowout that he himself had helped to create – that he would try to export some of that crisis in the traditional British way to Iceland. We, we hope not. Now, what we'll be doing in this broadcast is filling in how did we get to this, right? What is the nature of the Icelandic currency crisis? Because it starts with the crisis of the Icelandic crown, and then we're going to see the crisis of the Icelandic banks, the famous Kripthing, Glitnir, and Landsbanki, the three banks which took in tens of billions of dollars of deposits from depositors in Britain and Holland. Uh, and then, of course, when the bottom fell out of the world financial system, and we had the Lehman Brothers blow out AIG, Merrill Lynch, Wachovia, and all the rest, uh, the, uh, obviously these banks were uh, then in a banking panic mode, and it was impossible to cover the deposits, and there was a great deal of sabotage in the process by Gordon Brown and by uh, Balkanenda and his gang in The Hague in the Netherlands. So this is the money, the reason that the IMF uh, and the European Union and the British and the Dutch want the Icelanders to pay is because of these three uh, banks that had taken in all of these uh, deposits. It's simply, though, impossible. So we'll think about the strategies being used by the IMF, the need to reject the European Union, uh, and how this country can, uh, can renovate its economy. And we'll be using essentially the five-point program approach, which uh, listeners to this broadcast are familiar with. And I'm going to be joined later in the program by Thorarin Einarsson, who is one of the leading activists here on the Icelandic scene. I've just been, uh, thanks to Thorarin, uh, I've had... Uh, four lectures, a cycle of four lectures at the Reykjavik Academia, well attended by uh, influential opinion makers, policy makers, and others, three at the Academia, one at the Fridar Huzet, the um, Peace House, uh, which stressed also the need to restart the anti-war movement in uh, both uh, Iceland and in the United States, in particular with reference to the, to the Afghan war. So um, it's now October, and it looks like the tremors are beginning. You know, the United States government is now in a new fiscal year, and we've just had the third quarter to fourth quarter payment deadline, and we're beginning to see all kinds of tremors in the world financial system. All of this points, once again, to what we've been talking about, Jacques Attali, the former economic advisor to President Mitterrand of France, had been talking about a planetary Weimar, that is to say, a global hyperinflationary depression or hyperstagflation, similar to what happened to Germany in 1922 to 1923, but this time on a planetary scale, hitting the dollar, hitting the euro, hitting the yen, hitting just about everybody. So that's our topic for today. Stay with us and we'll be back in just a minute. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. This, we, this week we're broadcasting here from Reykjavik, Iceland with a report. It's a frontline report from the epicenter of a new economic war 
It's the Battle of the North Atlantic, except this time it's the British-Dutch combine, the Anglo-Dutch. Since 1688, the British and Dutch royal houses have practically been merged, right, since William and Mary came over in the glorious revolution of 1688. And this unity is figured forth, for example, in Royal Dutch Shell, which is the heart and soul of the world oil cartel. It's the flagship of the world oil uh, cartel and oligopoly. So it's British and the Dutch against uh, Iceland. Who's on the side of Iceland? Well, right now, alone, uh, gallant, courageous, and fighting this combine, which is now joined by the European Union, the bullies and Eurogarchs of Brussels, and, of course, the degraded exponents of the Washington Consensus over at the International Monetary Fund. They, of course, they live on what? On the Austrian school, on von Hayek and von Mises and Milton Friedman of the Chicago School. Anybody who...